to go here, folks. So anybody else wants to bop in, go ahead. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll have our usual trivia question at the end. All right, Remy, I think we're probably ready to go All on. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Remy Schultz, and I am the registrar at the Crested Butte Museum. Thank you so much for joining our seventh installment of the Crested Butte History at Home with Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush, and tonight we have Bruce Bartleson. Uh, I would like to start the evening by giving a land acknowledgement. So the museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, which is historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Incompadre Ute and the Tabawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty. We hope that you will take the time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruneau Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. Other ways to support Indigenous peoples of today and the past is to go beyond land acknowledgements. So please consider taking steps towards allyship and reconciliation by conducting your own research of Indigenous groups. Uh, we hope that you will consider becoming members of the museum or making a donation to support this program and all the work we do here at the museum. You can do that by visiting our website at crestedbutemuseum.com. The museum is currently open from 11 to 5 during the week and 11 to 6 on weekends, and we have several events coming up that I will tell you about. So you can join us every Friday at 10 a.m. at the museum for a 45-minute interpretive tour inside the museum. Learn about Tony's Conoco, old timers, and an in-depth look into our current exhibits. Um, please join us starting March 2nd for our CB walking tours every Wednesday at 2 p.m. with Glow Cunningham. March 30th at 5.30 p.m. tomorrow, we have the Paul Anderson book signing of his book, The Town That Said Hell No, Crested Butte Fights a Mind to Save Its Soul. And then after the book signing, uh, there's a seven o'clock flouching slideshow with Duane and George Sibley. Uh, the museum will be closed May, uh, April 10th to May 20th, and then we'll be opening back up on May 21st. And then May 18th, we have a melting pot cook-off here at the museum. So come one, come all. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be available at crestedbutemuseum.com and on our YouTube page within. So if you have any questions about our programming, visit crestedbutemuseum.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And you can also sign up for a newsletter. We will also always list our events in the newspaper. So look out for that one too. We will have time for questions at the end of the talk. Um, so please post those in the chat box or the Q&A box and I will write those down. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended and to our lead sponsors, Diane Woolery, in honor of John Yankovic, John Briggers Construction, and Cochevers. Without our sponsors, we cannot provide this series um, and your generous donations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramey, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, a great pleasure tonight to welcome Bruce Bartleson, who's going to talk about the geological history of Preston Butte and the surrounding area, the real history, as he says. But I want to mention also that we'd like to thank our sponsors who have been very generous and uh, a lot of you folks who have been on board. I also want to mention that in addition to Paul Anderson's book signing and then my slideshow tomorrow at seven at the museum, Pete Dunda as part of Flauschenk is going to have his band, the polka band, and that is going to be at Cochevers at eight o'clock on Friday evening. And then I think I'm right, uh, Remy, the, uh, on Saturday night, there's a pub crawl up here, right, yes, uh, at, at the museum. So we're looking forward to that. So enough uh, ado on that. I, right now, I want to introduce a great friend of mine who has taught at Western for 33 years, a professor of geology, uh, Bruce Bartleson. Uh, Bruce was a colleague of mine for a long time and now uh, is involved with the newspaper and and we call him Barometer Bartleson as he works on the weather and tells us the temperature and so on. So uh, a lot of people can ask questions about Lackalus and the individual mountains around Crested Butte, why we have so much coal, et cetera. So I'm going to get out of this seat. Bruce is going to move in the middle seat and uh, he is on. So welcome Bruce Bartleson. Okay, well, thank you, Duane. All right, tonight we're gonna to talk about the real history of the Crested Butte Gunnison region, okay? So let's go to the first slide. Okay. 
could be a slight delay here. <laughs> There we go. Okay, there, there's the, there we go. There's the opening slide there, the real history of the Crested Butte Gunnison country. Uh, okay, I came here in 1962, as a matter of fact, uh, the same year that Duane did. And if you'll notice this picture more closely, this is coming into town from Gunnison region. And we're just cresting the hill, going down to the bottom of the valley where Crested Butte is, and if you take a look, you'll notice that things are, are just a little different. Take a good long look. Like, for example, there's no schools anywhere. There's no development on the left of the highway. The place is pretty empty. That's the way the place was in 1962. Next slide, please. Okay, what I did at first was go up to Gothic, and this is Gothic in 1962, the home of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And you might notice that this looks a little bit different than what it looks like today. Uh, the place was uh, just getting started, really, to become more famous in uh, biological research. The next picture shows another view of the town. So you can see there's two, two or three new buildings over there. So they were just getting going. The, uh, uh, the place was quite quite quiet back then. There probably were about 20 students maybe that year. And I was camped out in a camp, in a tent over on the right side of the road there. Uh, let's see, can you use your slide? It's right over there. Yeah, there we go. That's the area where I was camped all, all summer long. I was working on my thesis for uh, my doctorate degree at the University of Colorado. And I had never been out here before. And so this was somewhat of a surprise to me as to what kind of country this was. Next slide. Okay, first you need, we need to have a little bit of perspective. We need a geologic time scale. The main uh, units you need to worry about are the Precambrian below, which is separated into three different provinces. Then there's the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. You can see in the Paleozoic, there are about six periods, six or seven periods, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, Permian. If you can't remember those, just uh, use this little jingle, come over someday, maybe play poker. And that will give you all of the periods of the Paleozoic. Then there's the Mesozoic with the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And then finally the Cenozoic broken into the well, we call it the tertiary and the quaternary mostly in the old days. Now it's called the paleogene and the neogene. So you can see on the side there, there's the time scale. For example, the Cambrian, where we're gonna start basically, is at 545 million years ago. And then the beginning of the Mesozoic is 250 million years ago. And that's when we first started seeing some dinosaurs. But let's get on with the main story right now. First, Here are some of the most ancient rocks in the, in the region. This, of course, is the Black Canyon. This is the Narrows region. And these rocks are the oldest around here. They're about 1.5, 1.7 billion years old. That's 1,500 to 1,700 million years old. Th these are Duane's favorite rocks, the only ones that he knows. It's called the Black Canyon Schist. Next slide, please. Now, I'm also going to talk about some of the ancient life in uh, the Crested Butte region. And here you have some of the old forms of uh, life in the Gunnison region. This, of course, is Dwayne Vandenbush with the painted wall as a background there, uh, showing you uh, what the Precambrian looks like. So these are ancient rocks that form what we call the basement of the, of the country, the basement rocks. Next slide. Okay, here's another view of this. This is an aerial view of the Hartman rocks looking to the north. Here's a, a view flying from the south to the north, and you can see the light-colored rocks there. Those are the, the um, what we call the annular structure, which is, means a circular structure of the rocks around the Hartman Rocks area, but that's also Precambrian. Next slide. Okay, here's what the area looked like about 500 million years ago during the late Cambrian period. If you will notice the four corners, can you show them the four corners there? 
You know, there's the, the four corners are right there. Right there we go. There's the four corners yeah. region. And that's where we are on the left side. Notice that two things you should notice. One, that the country was mostly covered with water, not completely, but there was a long spine down the southwestern part of the country called the, the transcontinental arch. And you should notice also that that north arrow shows which way north was. So our country was rotated 90 degrees from what it is today. And furthermore, that white line there is the equator. So not only have we turned sideways from we are today, but also the, we are near the equator at this time. So if you were here at this time, you'd have a, a nice sandy beach. Next slide. Here are some of the rocks of that region. This is up Dead Man's Gulch by Spring Creek. Uh, I'm sure Pete Dundon knows these rocks right in here. He's been there a few times. And there is the most of the Paleozoic section. You're looking at the, uh, the Wash and the Manitou and the Chaffee. And up on top is the Leadville Formation. That's most of the Paleozoic section here. These are all shallow marine because at this time, the country was underwater most of the time. Next. Here's some, more, some of the life. Of course, the most famous fossil of the Cambrian period is the trilobite. This one's called Flexicalamini. Uh, and it's only about two inches long, really. We need a scale there for that one. Next slide. Uh, here we are. Now I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Next, we go to the Devonian. And you can see the four corners again. right in that region. So we are in that area where the arrow was just briefly. And that will be, again, a shallow marine deposits. And there's the transcontinental arch again, only it's moved a little bit. We're a little more underwater. Next slide. Is a view looking up Cement Creek, as a matter of fact. You might notice, if you can look very closely, this is looking from the highway up Cement Creek. There's most of those rocks, or the, the, the same rocks there that were shown earlier are there. And at the top, there's a ledge. And if you look closely, there's kind of a, a, a hole in one of them, a little farther over. There you go. That's the caves of Cement Creek right there. Yeah, that's the cave trail. And of course, you've all been up there once or twice. That's in the Leadville limestone, which is, a again, a shallow marine deposit. Next slide. Okay, here we go to the time in geologic history, we probably had the greatest coverage of water covering the whole United States and most of North America. You can see we had a shallow limey bottom. What does that mean? Well, it means it's like the Bahamas. There was a, a white sandy area all across the country. And again, notice where the equator is. It's off to the side a little bit. We're turning though, we're starting to move into our present position. Next slide. Okay, here are some of the fossils, the, some of the, the rocks on Fossil Ridge. There's the Chaffee and Leadville. That's the Devonian and Mississippian rocks. The rocks at the top are the Leadville. That's the one that is the representative of the highest flooding of the continent in any one given time. Next. Here's a picture of the Leadville up Rosebud Gulch. I suppose you've probably been up there at one time or another. This is a branch of Dead Man's Gulch and in the Spring Creek area. And that bit, those big cliffs formed Leadville limestone. Next slide. Some of the fossils that exist at that time were th these things. These are called crinoids or sometimes called sea lilies. They actually were attached by a stem to the bottom seafloor. At this time, they were in fairly shallow water, but the modern ones that we have today, and they, they still have crinoids today, uh, live mostly in deep water. And some of them actually float. But this, this is a good display from the, the state of Iowa, as a matter of fact. Next slide. Okay, now things start to change. In the Pennsylvanian, or the late Paleozoic, remember, come over someday, maybe play poker. We're in the PPs now. Colorado is broken up into two different mountain ranges, the Front Range Highland, which is very close to the modern day Front Range, and then the Uncompahgre Highland, which is uh, somewhat like the Uncompahgre Highland, only it's a lot more extensive. You can see Gunnison and Crested Butte on the map. And so Crested Butte was right on the edge of the 
mountain range and off in the center of the basin, there was called the central Colorado trough. That was a basin that was receiving sedimentary rocks being eroded from the mountain ranges. For an example, next slide. Some of the rocks look like this. This is called the Gothic formation. This is a conglomerate with lots of limestone pebbles in it. These were eroded off of the highland from some of the rocks like the Leadville limestone. In fact, I think those are our Leadville fossils in some of those rocks there. So this was a conglomerate that was formed. In this case, it was by Perry Creek, halfway between Crested Butte and Gothic. Next. Okay, for, a, for an analog, the rocks you just saw would have formed in one of those deposits in the fan. You can, you can see the fan there. That's an alluvial fan. And we think that many of the rocks that formed in this area formed in a situation just like that at that time. So next slide. <clears throat> also, as it turns out, we have some reefs or bioherms offshore just a little bit in the Gothic formation. This is in the Copper Creek Valley. And you have to hit this twice to get the arrows there. Those red arrows are pointing out, there's one more there. Though those things are what we call bioherms. They're actually a type of reef, but not completely like a modern day, modern day reef. So if you were in Crested Butte looking to the, uh, let's see, at that time it would be to the east, you would have been in a view like this. There's Crested Butte off to the left there. <laughs> there we go, sorry. There's, imagine you're in Crested Butte and that's what it would look like if you looked out, to, out the window. Okay, so this, by the way, is the Blue Lagoon in the Bahamas, but that's what we call a shallow limey bottom, by the way. Okay, next. Okay, as time goes on, the mountain ranges begin to wear down, and as a result, you get more and more uh, alluvial fan material forming. And here, of course, is a view of the south peak of the Maroon Bells, taken from just down below West Maroon Pass. And that's, of course, the famous maroon formation. Next slide. Here's another view of the area there. In that case, we're looking a little farther to the right, looking down the Maroon Peak Valley, and that's Pyramid Peak in the center there. That's part of the maroon formation. So this material is being shed from the ancestral Rocky Mountains and it's sort of fans. Next slide. Uh, yet another one, Tiakali Tia Mountain, another uh, example of the maroon formation forming from the erosion of the ancestral Rockies. Next slide. And I had to put this one in. This, of course, is uh, the very famous view of the Maroon Bells from the trailhead. And there's Maroon Lake. In this case, uh, this was a couple of years ago when the uh, lake froze over like a sheet of glass and the local people actually rode their bikes. The road was closed and they rode their bikes up and ice skated there. So this is a great picture. Okay, now we're going to move on because we have a lot of country to a lot of time to cover. Uh, during the Jurassic, great sand dunes blanketed the southwest. You can see where it says sand in there in southwestern Utah. That is the approximate location of Zion, and those huge cliffs of Zion are an example of this Jurassic sandstone covering the country. Notice the ancestral Rockies off to the right of the sand are still present, but almost all worn down by now. They're getting old and feeble as all mountains do sooner or later. Next. Okay, here's a picture of one of those sand dunes. We have an equivalent sort of, of the Navajo sandstone in the, uh, from the Zion area. This is called the Junction Creek. It's a little bit younger, but it's the same sort of deposit. Notice the cross bedding there, the beds are all dipping. That's the face of an old dune you're looking at there. Okay, now in the Jurassic, we're in the late Jurassic now, 150 million years ago. What we're looking at is a vast floodplain covers the Western part of the United States. The ancestral Rockies are pretty much gone. And we have the very famous Morrison Formation. And here's the slide, you have to hit this again. There's the maroon formation again. 
There's the Morrison Formation right there. There's the Entrada down below. Anyway, the Morrison is the formation that formed at this time in that vast floodplain across the country. The Morrison is famous for dinosaurs. And in fact, we have our own dinosaur here. Next slide. Oops. <laughs> yeah, keep, keep, those, keep those names in mind there. Those are all important. Okay. Uh, about six miles east of Gunnison, some of our students, the fact it was uh, two of our uh, most illustrious wrestlers at Gunnison in those days, uh, Ken Snyder and his brother, uh, were out arrowhead hunting one day in the, on a sunny Sunday afternoon, and they stumbled upon a bone sticking out of the ground. They started to excavate, and pretty soon they found a dinosaur, which was an apatosaurus or a brontosaurus. They've gone back and forth to the names now in recent history. But there are some students excavating some of Morris's remains. And if you had everything put back together, we didn't have this much of the skeleton. We had quite a bit of it, as it turns out, maybe 55, 65%. But this would be what Morris would have looked like when he was in his prime. Okay, back to the Morrison formation. There you see the red colors. That's the Morrison. And that's, by the way, you almost always will, if you look, you will find fragments of dinosaur bones. They were all over the place at this time directly above the Morrison, you see a big cliff of sandstone. That's the Dakota sandstone, which is a beginning of the uh, big transgression of the seaway coming into North America again. Um, some of, if you look at them, some of these rocks more closely, you'll see that the Dakota sandstone is all full of burrows. You notice that chapstick. And then there's a bunch of squiggly lines. What is going on there is that there were animals kind of like a marine invertebrate, uh, something like a spider, maybe more like a crab would be better. And they were burrowing down in the ground looking for food. Those are all individuals burrowing into the sand. And this shows that it was along a beach or a shallow tidal flat. Next slide. Here are some ripples on the marine Dakota, which again proved that it was a shallow seaway. So the country is becoming flooded again for the first time in some time after the Paleozoic. Okay, here's the, the Cretaceous period, the last period of the Mesozoic. And you see the green area there is the, uh, the great Cretaceous transgression across the country where the Country was largely flooded, but not nearly as much as during the Mississippi, and as you can see. And <clears throat> notice that to the west of us, by the way, notice that we are getting pretty close to the, uh, the present day uh, position of the country and the present day latitude. We're still a little bit farther south, though. Notice there's the 30 degree north latitude line there. And you can see the mountains are starting to form from a, uh, a new event happening in the Pacific Ocean. Next slide. Uh, the <clears throat> rocks that first form in this seaway are a black shale called the Manca Shale. This is the East River Falls right below Gothic. And here the rocks are a little bit metamorphosed or hardened up by some uh, igneous activity nearby. But here's another slide. Here is the Manca Shale. Uh, in the just above the Obi Joyful Falls, which some of you have probably kayaked down. Uh, you have, I suppose. I have not. No, have not done that. Well, don't do it, please. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's the same area. That's the same rock. So that's all forming in as a, a as a muddy deposit in the bottom of this great Cretaceous seaway. Uh, out in to the west of town, towards Montrose. <clears throat> you'll see that uh, most of the country there is full of this Mancus shale, just the, that forms what we would call badlands. This is near Montrose. Okay, what's going on here is that the Farallon plate, that is, a, it's a, a portion of the Pacific Ocean, starts to dive underneath North America. And notice 100 million years ago, what we call the severe orogeny, or the Sevier, if you wish, 
uh, that the rocks are being crumpled and there's a fold and thrust belt in that slide there, right below the arrow, you can see that, and there's some volcanism going on. But this is what's driving a, um, a new formation starts come up at this time. Next slide. Okay, here's what's going on. You can see the mountains, the mountains to the left, to the west side of the picture. And notice there are deltas forming in Colorado at this time. And this is what we call the Mesa, the formation of the Mesa Verde formation. And you can see what's happening because of the, the plate, the Farallon plate going underneath North America is pushing some of those mountain ranges up. And as a result, pushing back into that old continental seaway, you can see that there's gonna be deltas. Well, those deltas had all kinds of organic material this time. We were so close to the equator. And so this is a perfect formation in these deltas to form coal swamps. Next slide. And here we have some of the, do this again. There's a delta channel right there. There's a delta channel forming in that time. And as a result, you're gonna find coal after a while. That is, it doesn't form right away, but it formed much, much later because of all the organic matter was being compressed after this area was being buried and compacted. So that organic matter that formed in the coal swamps now turns into coal. And as a result, of course, this is what made Crested Butte famous. Next slide. Here's some coal mines near Somerset that are now, I think, pretty well shut down. Next. And here is Crested Butte, and here are the Coke ovens at Crested Butte, circa 1910. Uh, Duane will tell you how many coal coke ovens there were. It was 100 and what? 154. 154 coke ovens in Crested Butte, circa at, uh, in, around the turn of the century. Now, the reason for this was they were taking the coal, which was a soft coal, and coking it, that is, cooking it under high temperatures but low oxygen. And this made it much more, much harder and much more rich in carbon. So it would burn at a higher temperature, and that would produce coke for the steel mills at Pueblo. Next slide. Here again are the Crested Butte Coke ovens. This is in the vicinity of Crested Butte, the, the bench today, right there. Things have changed a bit. Next slide. Okay, now it turns out that the continents are not completely at rest. So we start getting the continents moving apart. Notice that Africa and Europe and North America, NAM, GRN, UR, ERU, AFR, and so on, are moving apart. You can see, though, that there is another uh, addition to the mountain range. Let's look towards our part of the country, and you can see the Laramide orogeny is forming here. Now, this is the rise of the modern Rockies. Next slide. And what's happening here is that the plate is, is going out more and more shallow, and as a result, it forms <clears throat> some foreland ranges in the lower diagram. Notice the foreland ranges there. Yeah, that's the area right in there. That would be what's forming the modern Rockies right now because there's gonna be compression produced by that plate, plate pushing against the more rigid part of the continent. Uh, one of the rocks that forms at this time is the Wasatch Formation. And this, of course, you've probably all been there. This is from the top of Scarp Ridge, looking down into Obi Joyful country. And that red rock there is not the maroon formation. This is another rock that looks red, but it is not the maroon. It's much younger. This is Paleocene and Eocene, right into the tertiary now, or the Cenozoic period. Next slide. Here's some more of the Wasatch Formation. There's the Ruby Range above Lake Irwin, and there's the famous dike off to the left which was intruded into that later. Next slide. Okay, now what's really interesting here is as this plate keeps on pushing, the rocks get folded and twisted and turned, start from the top and notice how the rocks keep on getting squished and squashed more and more. And finally, at a certain point, you get what we call a thrust fault. Notice that the rocks from below are thrust over younger rocks there. 
And that is what's happening here in the Gunnison country. As you go between Crested Butte and Gothic, you'll see exactly that sort of situation going on. And I'll show you. Next slide. Oops, another thrust fault. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Here is the Elk Mountain Structure Zone. There is a young Tom Prather looking out from Hasley Pass, looking out to the north. And you can see the beds are all dipping vertically. That is, they're all horizontal because of the squashing of the rocks. And here's just south of Copper Creek, just south of Gothic. You can see the rocks are getting turned a little more. And there's a maroon formation in the Gothic. Okay, here we are now. Along the Gothic Road, if you look up at a place called Perry Creek, you'll see that the beds have com been, been completely overturned by the, th by the thrust faulting. So everything is upside down there. The Gothic formation is supposed to be below the maroon, and you can see that it is not. It is on top of it. A great place to go to. As you continue coming to the south, we get what we call the Crested Butte lineament. Here's Crested Butte Mountain in the background, Round Mountain, and now we're on the Jack's Cabin Divide up above it. Actually, I was flying in this case above the region. And next slide. And finally, if you chase this far enough, you can offset it a little bit toward the Taylor Park Dam. And here's the Sawatch Sandstone, which is Cambrian. And here it's been twisted and turned again by all of this compression caused by the plate moving underneath North America. Okay, this gets kind of interesting. Now you can see this first slide, the top slide during the Mesozoic. That's what we already had going. We had this thrust fault acting. Now, later in the Cenozoic, as the Farallon plate keeps on moving underneath North America, you'll, you start to get partial melting of the crust. It keeps on sliding and rubbing. It's mostly a matter of friction. And so now you're going to start getting some magma bodies, hot molten rock rising up into the sediments there. Next slide. Okay, here is a geologic map, a crude geologic map of the Elk Mountains. You can see Almont at the bottom, Crested Butte, and uh, Gothic on there, marble, aspen, basalt, and off to the far left of the slide, the top of the slide is carbon day. The red represents the maroon formation. Remember now the maroon formation formed originally from alluvial fans dumped into the central Colorado basin, or the, or the trough. The orange marking on there are some of those igneous bodies. The top one, top one is Mount Sopris. The middle one is the snowmass body. And then on the, to the left over there is the Raggeds and Chair Mountain. And then to the right, and to the right is White Rock Mountain, which looks like a big dragon to me, only kind of folded over a little bit. Notice also, you can see Crested Butte Mountain. There is a, uh, a mountain range there shown on Crested Butte Mountain. So those are all igneous rocks. The blue is the formation, the Gothic formation that I was looking at. Uh, because it was more interesting. Next slide. Okay, here's the Snowmass Mountain, and you can see why it's called Snowmass. I think we're going to have, yeah, there we go. There's Snowmass. I love the arrows. There's the Maroon Formation, and there's Snowmass. That's part of the, that's the main body of the Snowmass stock there. So that was magma coming up from below because of this friction of the horizontal plate going underneath North America, melting some of the lower crust and that magma body came up and intruded into these rocks here. There's White Rock Mountain from a distance. Next slide. There is Star and Taylor Peak right there, taken from the uh, saddle right before Crystal Peak, looking down into the upper headwaters of the Taylor River. But that's, that, that's also part of the, of the White Rock stock. And then there's Crested Butte. Yeah, here's a picture which probably looks a little different to you. This is taken from the top of the hill overlooking town uh, in 1962. The main road today is off to the right of this slide, but you can see things look a little bit different there in 62. 
but Crested Butte Mountain is a lacolith. Okay, so what's a lacolith? Next slide. Well, that's what a lacolith looks like. <laughs> yeah, it does. It looks, you notice that it has a dome shaped top and a flat floor, and uh, it sits there by itself, only it's a little more complicated than that. The next slide. Uh, here's another slide of a lacolith. You can see here it's intruding into uh, older sedimentary rocks and then it pushes them up. Next slide. Here's a better shot of the whole, whole idea. There's the origin of a lacolith. There, there's Crested Butte Mountain taken a little bit uh, more recently. And you can see the granite of Crested Butte. That, that's what formed from the magma body. And then there's that flat floor, more or less, and at one time it domed up the whole region. Other lacoliths in the area are Carbon Peak, Gothic Mountain, Mount Whetstone, Anthracite Range, Marcelina, Mount Gunnison, and so on. Next slide. There's a picture of Gothic Mountain. You can see the shale of the Mancus Formation below it, and there it shows the flat floor of it. Next slide. There's Marcelina taken from the top of Mount Emmons, uh, sometimes called Red Lady, although people should know that Red Lady is the name of the basin and the mountain is called Mount Emmons, but there's Marcelina Mountain there. And that's the Lacolith. Next slide. Okay, now we go into the West Alps. It turns out there's more than one mountain range around here. Just to the east and north of Crested Butte is the, is the Elk Range or the Elk Mountains. To the west is, are properly called the West Elk Mountains. And here is a crude geologic map. All those pink blobs are lacoliths, so you can see a whole cluster of them. Um, the red lines to the top of that map represent the area around Mount o Ruby, Ruby and Owens. Those were the dikes. And then that orange area with a kind of a deeper color lavender in the middle represents the West Elk Volcano, which formed at this time, about 30 million years ago. Next slide. Well, here would be a view that Duane took 30 million years ago. There is the West Elk Volcano, looking at it from Gunnison. Uh, yeah, I'm just kidding, of course. That is Mount Shasta, actually. But that's what Gunnison would have looked like. Uh, some of the geologists at Western, notably Alan Stork of our geology department, has estimated that the West Elk Volcano was between 15 and 18,000 feet above sea level at that time. So it would have been a huge mountain covering over the whole region. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that, th the way that the West Elk Volcano e erupted was mostly by lahars, that is mud flows that e erupted out of the mountain periodically. And it never really had many big lava flows, but it mostly erupted mud and rock fragments that were uh, deposited on the flanks of the volcano. And so a lot of the deposits of what we call what's left of the West Elk Volcano is called the West Elk Breccia. Next slide. And there are the, there are the castles, which is a remnant, a erosion remnant because of uh, some complicated geology there, uh, it's complicated weathering really. So those are fins of the West Elk Breccia. Next slide. There, of course, are the famous pinnacles of the Blue Mesa area, and that is also part of the West Elk Volcano, or the remains of it. Okay, now, if you go up to North Pole Basin, you will see some white stripes, like there, up high. And those white stripes are limestone that has been metamorphosed into marble. Marble, you can see the white color there. That's the color of marble. Next slide. This shows an old slide of the marble quarries at Marble, Colorado, when they were excavating that very same marble there. There the beds are thicker in, a, in the center of the, of the what's called Treasure Mountain area. And this was quarried for what, 20 or 30 years, Duane, is that right? Mm -hmm. More than that. More than that. And one of the most famous parts of the quarry, next slide, were that the, a, a block of marble was taken to the tomb of the unknown soldier in Washington. And here is the 
block of marble. Next slide shows the actual block. There's the block of marble itself. And that is being taken to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. As I understand it, it took them quite a while to get that out of there. Four days, 3.9 miles. There you go, four days. Three point, and how long did it take them to quarry that limestone? I, I'd been told that they spent months on getting that block out of the, uh, out of the quarry, getting it separated out as a big block. At any rate, that's part of the history of Colorado there. Next slide. All right, now we come down to the end of the line here more or less. This is during the Pleistocene, the last few million years. This is about two million years ago. Notice that all of that white area are glaciers. This is the what's called the Pleistocene. And you can see New York City was under ice. We had large lakes formed in the Basin and Range province. That's when Great Salt Lake formed. And you can see that in some of the mountains, though, we had, uh, we had mountain glaciers or valley glaciers also. But there in the main part of the slide, you can see that the ice sheets covered most of Canada and parts of, North America, parts of the United States. Next slide. Okay, if you were to go to Ta Taylor Park and had been there 20,000 years ago, you would have had this view. There's Park Cone, which is in the center. And just imagine that all of those clouds are actually ice. That's what Taylor Park would have looked like 20,000 years ago, because there was a huge glacier filled up the whole, whole, whole park. And it extended downstream about a couple of miles. Next slide. Okay, there's Park Cove. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, this is a view of the Aletsch Glacier in Switzerland, and it's a model for the Slate and East River Valleys. Notice that there is some debris formed along the side of the glacier. This glacier has shrunk considerably, and at one time it was as high as that red arrow, and that red arrow shows where debris has been left alongside of the glacier. That's called a lateral moraine there, and that was just debris that was scraped off from the, from, from the, from the rocks as the glacier went by, so the glacier has shrunk considerably. Okay, this is what the valleys would look like around here. There's a lateral moraine. Um, no. No, no, no. <laughs> Go back. The lateral moraine, oh, this is what I want, is right in here. This is the lateral moraine here, going all along here. So the glaciers came down from the slate and from the East River Valleys and formed along the side of the valley. So this is all lateral moraine. Okay, here's where the glaciers ended, just south of Crested Butte, just south of the Country Club. I guess it's called the Club at Gunnison now, the at Crested Butte. Butte. The Club at Crested <laughs> Butte now. This is just about a half mile south. And so you can see, I hope, the moraine there. This is the terminal moraine. This is as far as the glaciers got in this gust in the Crested Butte country. At one time, the glaciers shrunk or retreated, I guess I should say, and the moraines were here, and this area became a great lake. This is the wetlands now where there's no development allowed for good reason. It's got a very high water table, but this probably was a great lake at this time, about 15, 20,000 years ago. There would, there would have been water all through here. And you could have been swimming, gone fishing, and that sort of thing in the Cunison region. Um, other features of the glaciation are, of course, bowl-shaped basins called cirques, like these. These are called cirques, and they are formed by the glacier forming at the very high part of the peak, and as they start to grow and uh, ad advance, moving downhill by gravity, they will pluck some of the rocks. And so you get these bowl shaped basins where the glacier started there. Here is the East River Valley, which was completely glaciated here. And here's a big cirque right here at, um, uh, I forgot the name of that mountain right now, but I know what it is. At any rate, this was the Valley of the East. This is taken from above Gothic, by the way. 
and you're looking up valley towards Schofield Pass this way here. Here's the Slate River Valley taken from the uh, from near the Paradise Divide, looking down the valley, and here you can see all of the smoothing of the glacier out here. Here's Mount Emmons over here, and you can see how this valley has been shaped by the ice here, all smoothed out. Now, okay, here is a kind of a three-dimensional map of the Crested Butte. Here's Crested Butte. Here's the town of Crested Butte. Here's the mountain Crested Butte. Here's the East River Valley. Here's uh, Washington Gulch, and here's the slate right here. Now, ice came down both the slate and Washington Gulch and the east, and they all met about where those, oops. They all met right about in here. And those were the, that was the end of it right there. So let's see. Okay, here is a, an imaginary view of Crested Butte 20,000 years ago. Here would be the East River. Here's the slate coming down. And here is the terminal moraine right here, just south of the country club at Crested Butte. Got the idea? So this is what it would, would have looked like at that time, if you've been here about 20,000 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And sooner or later, the ice melts. It gets warmer. The climate warms. And the ice melted back. And, but it left these moraines right here, just where we showed them a little while earlier. Can we go back to those? There's a lateral moraine, and there's the moraines at Crested Butte right there. So that's where we're going up right now. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the show here. Uh, some of the, some of the, of the game that we used to hunt was the woolly mammoth at Blue Mesa. This would be about 10,000 years ago. We actually have some woolly mammoth remains up by uh, Cerro Summit, as a matter of fact, uh, in one of the formations there. Uh, they, they've been gone for a while. Now, one of the most exciting times in Crested Butte history, though, was the, uh, the gold rush of Colorado in 1859 and in the 1860s. Here is the oldest known picture of Dwayne Vanden Bush. I don't know who the guy is with the soldier here. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the first part of the rush. And what happened was this. During the time when there was a lot of magma being erupted in Colorado, which we've shown by the White Rock Mountain and the snow mass and so on, there was also a zone of lineation that went northeast, southwest across the strait called the Colorado Mineral Belt. And you can see some of the towns here. Here's Rico, there's Durango, there's Uray, there's Lake City, there's Gunnison, there's Crested Butte, there's Aspen, Leadville, Gilman, Breckenridge, Climax, Central City, Boulder, and at the end of it, the same sound. All of the major mining towns of Colorado lined up on that particular trend called the Colorado Mineral Belt. There appears to have been a weakness in the fundamental crust, the Precambrian crust at that time. And so when the magma bodies came up, some of them came up along that zone and they had some minerals with them that were deposited as ore deposit, like this. Here would be a quartz vein. Most of the gold formed in quartz veins. Here's the gold right here, of course. And then this looks like Sphalerite and zinc sulfide, and the rest of this is quartz. Some of the mines around here, which were pretty big, here's the Carter mine up Gold Creek, uh, which was one of the big, there are about four or five mines up Gold Creek, as a matter of fact, near Ohio City. And of course, Crested Butte had their fair share too. There was the Standard mine. There was the, um, the Sylvanite mine up by Gothic. Uh, the, um, give me some more mines, Dwayne. Forest Queen. Forest Queen was up by Irwin, one of the great silver mines of all time. So all of that formed at this particular time in geologic history. And that's what got everybody coming to Crested Butte. <clears throat> okay, here we have, we're, we're wrapping up here. Here's the winter of 1896. Uh, do you know any of these people, Dwayne? I don't. Any sorry. idea? This is a shot I got from, I think, from you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what time of year it was. I suspect that's midwinter. 
Here is a picture of, uh, see, do you recognize any of these guys, Dwayne? That's Al Johnson on the right there. Right, that's Al Johnson. Okay. And where's- uh, That's Erwin. That's at- 1883. 1883, there mm -hmm. we go. So this was a big sport back then in, this, in these days. And have you ever tried any of these skis, Dwayne? No. No, you ever have. Uh, I understand there's somebody that still does this, <clears throat> comes up occasionally. Well, okay, there we are. There's the two of us at Ofer Pass in 2006. Still friends after all those years. And here we are still going the same. I end with this. That's it. It's a lovely quote. Do you want to ask your trivia question? We can, uh, okay, the trivia stuff. question. Yeah, the trivia question would be, during what period of geologic history was the continent most covered with water? During which period of geologic history was the country covered mostly with water? Tell them how to answer. If you um, answer in the chat box or the Q&A, I will grab your information. You can send an email, uh, if you win, to registrar at crestedbuttemuseum.com. First come, first serve, and uh, we're looking here, Bruce, what's the uh, answer? I don't want to tell him. <laughs> no, I mean, is that the correct answer? That's okay. Nope. Nope. No, we we've got a whole bunch of them, but uh, no correct that. answers yet. No, you're all missing. For a free book. Keep rolling. What period was, it, was the continent most covered with water? Mostly covered. Still waiting for a correct answer. Come over someday, maybe play poker. Give you a clue. It's in the Paleozoic. Cambrian? It's, no, it's not the Cambrian. It's not the Cambrian. We're getting a lot of answers, but uh, nothing correct yet. There we go. Somebody got it right. Mississippian. That's the right answer. The Mississippian. All right, Ian, uh, we need to have you give us your uh, address. And one of my books will be on the way. Ian, I'll send you an email. <laughs> now, uh, Bruce, uh, slide over just yeah, a little sure. bit. <clears throat> Tremendous job, uh, Bruce. And I wanted to mention to everybody that uh, next week is going to be my last one on the podcast. And it'll be the, uh, I think, the best one that I do and the most appropriate one that I do. And it'll be on immigration and the ethnic people of Crested Butte. So that'll be on next Tuesday, and that'll be the last one. That's number eight in the series of eight. Now, this is a great job by Bruce, and uh, we always like to open it up to questions. So are there any questions that anybody has regarding the geologic history of Crested Butte, which has got Lackalus, which has got coal? We got a town eight miles south of Crested Butte called Glacier, and I think, Bruce, that's about where the glaciers uh, pretty, pretty ended. Close. Pretty close. Yeah. It's a little south. So any questions or comments? Got a lot of good comments on great job and so forth. And uh, can you put in context the era of the Grand Canyon and the area around Crested Butte? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the walls of the Grand Canyon are the same age as the uh, Cement Creek, just, just like that. And also Dead Man's Gulch, that area there. Yeah, that's the Paleozoic is formed there. So we have the very similar rock types. What aspect of all of this have you studied the most? The Pennsylvanian. Pennsylvanian era. Yeah. Can people still find gold around town? You know, I think the answer to that is, is yes. And there are some people who pan in the summertime now, most of the streams have pretty well been panned out, but of course, uh, up at the head of Washington Gulch and uh, the Slate River and the East River, if you go up near the head, you're always bound to find a little dust. I don't know if it's worth uh, your, your time and effort, however, but a lot of those streams have been panned out in the 1860s. Why the Pennsylvanian? What interests you most about the area? <clears throat> Because that's what gave me my doctorate degree from CU. <laughs> that was the thesis I worked on. Well, it's because the rocks were most interesting. They had fossils in them. They had limestones. They had uh, conglomerates. And so the rock types had probably the most variation. 
of any of the rock types around here for a sedimentary geologist that is. Now, some of the other people who are more interested in igneous rocks would like Crested Butte Mountain or Treasure Mountain or something like that. Bruce, you're getting a lot of great comments. Uh, any other questions that anybody has? While we're waiting for any other questions, a little reminder of what's going on. This is gonna be a, kind of a fun-filled week. Um, yeah, we are just talking about the, the comments that are coming in are great. Uh, tomorrow night, Paul Anderson, 5.30 to 6.30 at the museum, the book signing, uh, which is a great book. My slideshow on the history of skiing in the, in the uh, Crested Butte and Gunnison area is at seven o'clock at the museum. Uh, Friday at eight o'clock at Cochevers, Pete Dunda and the Great Polka, along with the crowning of the King and Queen of Flauschenk. Saturday, the pub crawl at Crested Butte at the museum. Sunday, the ski area closes up. And that's going to wrap it up for the skiing. What's one of your favorite hikes, Bartleson? Another question. Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Wow. To Aspen? I guess, I guess going up towards West Maroon Pass still is my favorite. Um, yeah, I have to say that. Maybe taking 401 and then going up into the uh, area of West Maroon Pass, kind of crossing over and going that way. Yeah. That's really a great hike. But there's a lot of good ones. There really are. You can't miss around here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like Scarp Ridge. That, that's, that's a lot of fun. And then Dwayne and I like to go up the uh, Crystal Peak Trail now, up, yeah. the, up at the head of Cement Creek. That's awfully good. Too. Star Pass. Star or, Pass, right. Yeah. yeah. I go to Star. Yep. Any other questions or comments that everybody has? If there aren't, thanks for being on board. Great presentation by Bruce. Thank you very much, Bruce, for doing this for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will see everybody next week on Tuesday or by the end of the week. There are all kinds of stuff going on. So if you're in town, hit the slideshow or the polka party. All right, folks, over and out. Thanks a million. Thanks, everyone. Good job. Really good job. Thank you.